Hello, and welcome to another discussion on nutrition. As a reminder, my name is Tony Gist, and today we're going to be talking about lipids and fats. And let me start by sharing my screen with you so we can discuss it more candidly. And so when we talk about lipids and fats, oftentimes when people look at the nutrition facts panel, the thing that they think of is fats, 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 fats. Well, in reality, the term total fat should actually say total lipid on that nutrition facts panel. And I'll explain to you why in a little while. But let's start by sharing with you why lipids are so important to understand. Lipids have things in that class that are called essential fatty acids. If we do not consume these essential fatty acids, we will become very sick. And we'll discuss why later in this topic. It's also recommended that you consume a little less than 30% of your calories from lipids if you're consuming a typical American diet. Um, the reason being most people who are consuming a typical American diet are having things like, um, I get a little peanut butter here and some other like um, fried snacks or French fries or hamburgers, things that don't necessarily have the healthiest lipid profile. So you may notice that other countries like Spain and Greece who consume more of like a Mediterranean diet, they have a much higher percentage of calories from lipids or fats, but their total calories um, might be a little bit lower. The percentage of calories from lipids or fats might be a little higher, but the type of lipids or fats that they're consuming are coming from things like sardines, cold pressed extra virgin olive oil and other healthier lipids or fats that they would have in their diet. Another piece to understand is that overconsumption by a lot or improper consumption of the particular essential fatty acids or other lipids that you have in balance is associated with some major causes of death like cardiovascular disease and more. So we've got several learning objectives we wanna cover. The first is we want to define key terms when we're discussing lipids or fats. We want to identify which lipids are solid or liquid at room temperature. We want to provide examples of various types of lipids and food sources. We would like to explain why some lipids are considered healthier than others. And we also want to discuss behaviors that may actually alter blood cholesterol levels. So we're beginning with a definition. Very simply put, lipids are any of a class of organic compounds that are fatty acids or their derivatives and are insoluble in water, but soluble in organic solvents. And that sounds like a lot to take in, but just keep in mind, if something is organic, it contains a carbon. So all of these lipids have a carbon with them. Also, we have these fatty acids or derivatives that are not going to be soluble in water. So lipids contain a carbon, they don't mix with water, but they do mix with other organic solvents. So that, that, that's how we define a lipid. And when we talk about our food, there are certain types of lipid subclasses that are more pronounced, more consumed, more discussed than others. So let's talk about some of those. So with this, we wanna use a flow chart or a mind map to discuss the fats or lipids. So I created one just for you to simplify this discussion. And so what we wanna know when we look at this mind map is what is the chemical composition of each of these different um, segments? Also, what are the characteristics associated with that term? Where is that lipid found? Is it found in food? Is it found in the body? Can it be found in both? And then are there any other additional considerations that we want to take notes on? So this is our lipids flow chart that we're going to be diving into. And specifically, we're going to be talking about three lipid subclasses, the triglyceride and its components, the phospholipids, as well as lipoproteins and their components too. So we have it color coordinated here for those of you who can see color. So we'll start with the triglycerides because uh, like I've said before, we are not creative in the sciences at all. We name things either like after ourselves or very generally after what the thing is. So when we talk about a triglyceride, a triglyceride literally has a glycerol backbone. So that's there, that glyceride is there or that glycerol is there. And then we have tri, which means three. So we have three different fatty acids that can be attached to that glycerol backbone. Those three fatty acids can vary in composition, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. When we talk about the triglycerides, 
these are the most important ones to fully understand. And the reason I say this is because almost all of the lipids in our body and in our food are in the form of these triglycerides. And if you're trying to kind of picture what that looks like, when we look at a food label and it says fats or total fats on that nutrition facts panel, that is technically almost completely composed of the lipid triglyceride. When we look at our body, we have healthy stores of body fat that we use during times of need or help us through the rigors of reproduction, extreme circumstances like illness or injury. Lipids are used for a variety of things. So we do want to make sure that we do have a little bit of lipid or fat on our body. And the lipid that is most um, pronounced in our body is going to be these triglycerides as well. So we have fat which is going to be a triglyceride on our hips, thighs, breasts, belly, et cetera. Our bodies all store them magnificently in different locations, depending upon a variety of factors. If we want to look further on that mind map or that flow chart, we were going to discuss phospholipids. And phospholipids are a lipid that contains a phosphate group. So again, we are not creative in the sciences. Literally, it's a lipid that contains a phosphate group. That's it. And if we're trying to find these phospholipids in our food, egg yolks have an example of a phospholipid called lecithin. And that lecithin itself is going to allow egg yolks to be so versatile when we're making things like um, a Bernays sauce, a hollandaise sauce, a mayonnaise, because they actually have um, one side that is going to be water loving and one side that's going to be water hating. So it actually allows for you to make what we call an emulsification, or we're able to mix oil and water together. So if you have a pitcher and you have water and then you have a layer of oil, if you put enough egg yolks in there, you can mix it all together. Kind of crazy. In our body, we have a way that we want to separate fluid that's inside of our cells or intracellular fluid and fluid that's outside of our cells or extracellular fluid. And by doing that, we are going to be using a lipid bilayer and we use phospholipids that have, again, a water loving side and a water hating side that allow for that lipid bilayer to separate inside of our body cells and outside of our body cells. When we're talking about the third subclass, we are talking about lipoproteins. And this is very generally any group of soluble proteins that combine with a transport lipid in the blood. Pretty much these are lipids that are moving things throughout the blood. And there's a protein that is a component of it. That's the simple way to put it. And we do have lipoproteins in our body because it's moving things through the blood, but we do not consume lipoproteins in our food. So if you're someone who, um, you know, consumes a, again, traditional American diet and you're not drinking blood, you're not eating blood, you're not having blood as a component of an ingredient in your food, you're not consuming these lipoproteins. And so that's most of us. So I would say, generally speaking with a typical American diet, we are not consuming any lipoproteins. When we discuss the lipoproteins in the body, we scientists, doctors, other people like to simplify things for you. So we just call it like the blood cholesterol. Technically, when we talk about blood cholesterol, like HDL or that high density lipoprotein, that's technically a lipoprotein. HDL is an acronym for high density lipoprotein. Cholesterol is a component of that lipoprotein, but we try to simplify it and just call it, hey, the HDL is the good cholesterol. The LDL is low density lipoprotein. It actually contains more lipid relative to the protein and it has more deleterious or bad effects on your overall health. And therefore we call it the bad cholesterol. So when we talk about lipoproteins, oftentimes um, people discuss them as the blood cholesterol, HDL and LDL, and those are acronyms for high density lipoprotein or the good cholesterol and low density lipoprotein or the bad cholesterol. And if you're wondering what these lipoproteins look like, because doctors talk about them all the time and there's recommendations about how much you should have in your blood, et cetera. Here, we've got a picture of this good or bad cholesterol and its component parts. You'll notice that we have a surface coat 
on the outside. And then we have a lipid core on the inside. Um, it's almost like making kind of like a little water balloon where it's going to have this little, again, liquid component on the inside. So with this lipoprotein, it has several components. One component is cholesterol and cholesterol esters. We also have non-sterol lipids, such as triglycerides that are gonna be part of it as and free fatty acids. Then we have phospholipids. And again, that's gonna allow it to make that sphere like we we're expecting with a lipoprotein. And we also have protein and protein-based components. For the purposes of this class, we just want you to know that these lipoproteins are relatively complex and that if we're having something like a good cholesterol that we're discussing that's in the blood, it's actually a lipoprotein and it's going to have a higher ratio of protein in it relative to the lipids compared to the bad cholesterol. So if we did a little check-in, can you think in your head, what's going on with these lipids? Again, lipids technically are what we're discussing. Lipids are not soluble in water. And we have three major subclasses, the triglycerides, meaning three fatty acids attached to a glycerol, the phospholipids, which have a phosphorus and a lipid component, and the lipoproteins, which have a protein component. Hopefully it simplified it a little bit for you and that you can identify the chemical composition, where they might be found. And we've discussed a few additional considerations. Moving on to learning objective two, we want you to understand that, yeah, the thing that's on our nutrition facts panel where it says total fats, it's technically total lipids, and to complicate matters worse, fat has its own very specific definition with regard to food science and human nutrition. And fat is a lipid or a triglyceride that is solid at room temperature. So here you can see this beautiful picture of the to 2023 Illinois State Fair, and they always make this like butter cow. Um, I have seen it once before in my life. If you haven't seen it, I highly encourage you to go check it out. It's worth just a little glance. Um, so go to Springfield during the summer some year and check it out. They change what it looks like every single year. When we look at learning objective 2B, and we want to know where we find foodstuffs that contain fat, these solid triglycerides or these solid lipids, butter, think about it. If you put butter, a stick of butter on a, a plate, it literally stays that same exact shape, especially at room temperature. Lard, which is the back fat of a pig, is something that's cooked with when people are making flaky pastries oftentimes, and that is going to be solid at room temperature. Coconut oil, even though it has the word oil in it, that can be confusing because coconut oil is technically solid at room temperature. So scientifically, um, it is a fat. So it is going to be what we call a fat. Cheese has a lot of fat in it. And most of the cheeses have a lot of that solid fat. And that's what makes the cheese itself very solid. And here we have a picture of what we call marbled meats. So the meat, you can see the fat within that um, that muscle, as well as surrounding it, making almost like a marble-like visual aspect. And so with those marbled meats, those uh, the fat that's on there is solid. So again, it's a lipid, it is a triglyceride that technically can be subcategorized as a fat with regard to food science. In contrast, we have oils. And oils are going to be a lipid or a triglyceride that is liquid at room temperature. So if you think of cold pressed extra virgin olive oil, that is always going to be liquid at room temperature. And so we got it up here in the upper left hand corner of the picture where you can see that nice golden hue and you can picture pouring it out of that flask onto a salad or into a bowl where you might dip your bread. And you might wonder what are some other examples of foodstuffs that either contain oil or they themselves are oil. Well, corn oil is liquid at room temperature. So it's a lipid that is further categorized as triglyceride. And it is, according to food science, going to be an oil. Canola oil, peanut oil, fish oil, and olive oil are all additional examples of foodstuffs that are an oil liquid at room temperature, or they might contain an oil. Moving on to 2E, what does Harvard University say in their article, Nutrition 
coconut oil. Well, <laughs> most people are like, oh, coconut oil is fantastic. It made my hair so shiny. It made my face so amazing. It made my heart feel good and pitter patter in a good way. Well, um, when they're reviewing it, you can use this QR code to read this article. They um, did a survey or someone else did a survey, they were reporting it. And 72% of Americans currently rate coconut oil as healthy. Hmm. Because if we talk to nutrition experts, like a clinical registered dietitian, an individual who has a lot of schooling in nutrition and may have gone on to cardiovascular health, someone like myself, who's had, oh my goodness, I don't even know how many nutrition classes, or even someone who, again, has gone to medical school and then taken additional nutrition schooling on top of that. Only 37% of those individuals rate coconut oil as healthy. So the majority of them are like, no, we don't call coconut oil healthy at all. <sighs> kind of confusing because it gets a lot of press. Well, I will have to say that the news media loves to sensationalize things. That's why we keep reining you all in, those of you who are listening to these discussions and lectures and telling you go to reputable sources to find your information. And I would say that Harvard is a more reputable source no offense than Dr. Oz or someone else who's writing a popular press book. I trust Harvard. And in fact, the research says that, yes, coconut oil may be better for your heart health than butter, but I don't think anyone's saying that butter is good for your heart health. No one that I know of. So better than butter, but definitely not as healthful as other oils like avocado oil and olive oil, possibly even not as good as corn oil. So something to think about as you might try to spend extra money on something like coconut oil because you read an article in Men's Health saying that it's good for you. Go to first source research or reputable sources that put it together in a way that's meaningful and easy to read. When we look at our lipids, what percent of the lipids in our food stuff are in the form of triglycerides? Well, like I said before, it's almost all of them. Uh, mathematically, it's about 95% of the lipids in our food or in our body are in the form of triglycerides. So you can remember it this way. If you look at the nutrition facts panel, yes, cholesterol's on there. It's definitely on there. However, um, total fat, which again is a triglyceride, um, as well as its subcomponents, are going to be measured in grams, which is way bigger. I mean, multifold bigger than the milligrams that you might see in cholesterol. So when we start thinking about corn oil, butter, fish oil, lipids and cheese, any one of these is going to contain about 95% of its calories from triglycerides. Um, uh, 95, not 95, my apologies. If we look at just the lipid profile and we're teasing out just the fats or lipids that are in there, then ultimately 95% of those lipids that are in the cornell, butter, fish, lipids, and cheese are going to be in the form of triglycerides. When we're looking at foods that have a higher percentage of their calories from lipids or fats, I have a short list here and you can see these beautiful pictures that I found. So we have cheesy foods because if cheese has a really high percent of its calories from lipids or fats, um, then definitely cheesy foods are also going to fall in that category. Nuts, even though nuts have a high percent of their calories from lipids or fats, I still recommend them in moderation for heart health, anti-inflammatory properties, and meeting some other body needs. Seeds, the same way. But I don't recommend fried foods and snacks. I don't necessarily recommend fat-filled delicious desserts or some of those really high fat meats. And if you get a cut of, we'll say a prime rib, you might have a higher percentage of the calories from lipids or fats than you do from protein, even though you might think of it as a high protein meal. And so anything that has fat filled, like as a component of it, like if you have something that again is like a, a dessert and you they squeeze fat in it or they squeeze cheese in something else, then it's going to literally have fat that has um, increase the percent of calories from fat in that particular food. When we look at what foods contain select fatty acids in higher concentration, we want to really better understand what those fatty acids are. So let's quickly 
look at our triglyceride. As a reminder, we have that glycerol backbone, but here I picked a triglyceride that has three different types of fatty acids attached to it. So we can have a triglyceride that's in corn oil that has a variety of different fatty acids in length or in um, the number of double bonds or even in the location of those double bonds. So let's review very simply what is going on with these fatty acids. If you remember from the mind map and you no noted it a little bit before, we have one type of fatty acid that is called a saturated fatty acid. Saturated fatty acids do not have any double bonds in their long carbon chain within that fatty acid itself. So it's going to be S for saturated. I generally like to remember it as S for solid. So things like butter, coconut oil, things that are more solid as a fat are going to contain a higher percentage of the um, the fatty acids that are saturated. If we move on, we have cis monounsaturated fatty acids, and we can call these our MUFAs. So MUFA is an acronym for monounsaturated fatty acid, and we're referring to them as our cis monounsaturated fatty acids. So here you can see mono meaning one, and you can see a double bond right there in the middle. So and if it's if it's natural in your food, traditionally, it is going to be this cis monounsaturated fatty acid. Trans fatty acids, which have a double bond and have a different structure, those actually are mostly man-made. We can see some of them in our food, but most of the monounsaturated fatty acids are going to be cis monounsaturated fatty acids. Then we have our cis polyunsaturated fatty acids or our PUFAs. And this one right here is technically an omega-3 fatty acid. And with our fatty acids, we have two different sides. We have an alpha side and an omega side. And if we have a double bond that's on carbon one, two, three, that's the third carbon, and we can see a double bond there, then that would make this an omega-3 fatty acid. That's how they get the omega names too. When we're comparing our cis fatty acids and our trans fatty acids, the reason that we're more concerned about the trans fats is because they have um, a different chemical, um, I don't know, like conformation. So when we look at this long chain of carbons in our trans fatty acids, you'll notice the chain of carbons looks much straighter. It makes a much more solid fat at room temperature. Whereas if we have a more natural cis monounsaturated fatty acid, again, imagine a double bond there, then ultimately that is going to um, be much more liquid at room temperature. So when we're discussing the trans fats, man-made trans fats are made through taking something that traditionally had a cis double bond in it, like a corn oil, and then bubbling hydrogen through it, it makes that double bond less stable and actually like adds hydrogen to those carbon bonds. And so then in that situation, it makes it saturated momentarily. However, it's not real stable. So then, then it goes back to like a, a double bond, but the double bond changes and it becomes a different conformation. It becomes the trans conformation. So you can change something that's liquid or an oil, like a corn oil that has a lot of cis monounsaturated fatty acids to something that is a trans fatty acid that's man-made by hydrogenating it or bubbling hydrogen through it. It's not a good thing though. We don't want to have a whole bunch of trans fatty acids. We'll discuss that in a little bit, but let's see where most of these lipids are on the label, because this is where you're going to see it in the grocery store, because the math can be confusing. But let me remind you one more time. The triglycerides are composed of that glycerol and three fatty acids. So triglycerides are kind of referred to as like the total fat on a label and the fatty acids can vary in composition. So we can have a label like this one on the right. And if we want to look at it, we want to see what's going on with respect to this particular food stuff. Well, if we want to find out the triglycerides that are in that particular food stuff, we would look at the total fat here. So then if we want to move on and we want to see, hey, how is this triglyceride composed? What are some of those fatty acids that might be attached to it in relative ratio? Well, we can see the saturated fatty acids here. And so things like lard, butter, coconut oil would have a much higher percentage of the um, total fat 
as saturated fat. Then we have our unsaturated fat, which isn't late on the label itself um, because the unsaturated fat, they assume you know how to calculate it because total fats equal saturated plus unsaturated plus trans, but they do label the trans fat on there. And so most of your labels will say trans fat as zero because of the fact that we have started banning trans fat that's man-made from our food stuff. And we're going to touch on that a little bit more, but as we continue with the math, again, total fat equals saturated fat plus trans fat plus unsaturated fat. So if we were to find out how much unsaturated fat is in our food stuff, even though unsaturated fat is not on the label, we can calculate it. So if we look at this label right here and we're wanting to find out how much unsaturated fat there is, we can look at the eight grams of total fat. We can see the one gram of saturated fat. This particular food stuff has zero grams of trans fat. And then we can find out what's left over or solve for unsaturated fat. And if we do that, we find out that our this particular food stuff has seven grams of unsaturated fat per serving, because we can take the eight minus one and the zero, and then we find out that we have seven grams left over. So this can really make your mind blown. Like, wait a second. So I can have butter, which has a combination of saturated trans and unsaturated fatty acid. So show me what that looks like. If we were to dive in a little bit deeper, um, we have fatty acid composition percents. Um, and this is as a percentage of the total. So it's more or less showing you the ratio. And we've got up at the top of this particular um, image, we have solid fats like coconut oil is a very solid fat, palm kernel oil, butter, beef fat or beef tallow, palm oil, so on are all going to be types of fats that are going to be solid at room temperature. In contrast, on the bottom, you can see a list of different oils. And let's look at their fatty acid composition. When we look at the saturated um, foods, the ones that have a much higher percentage of that 100% that as a dark line, the coconut oil is again, like over 90% of the triglyceride is going to have saturated fatty acids attached as a component. If we get further down and we look at something like, we'll look at palm oil. Palm oil might only have, again, 50% of its fatty acid composition in the form of saturated fats. And then the rest of it is going to be a ratio of monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids that are left over. If we look at foods that have a lot of cis monounsaturated fatty acids, that's that midline right in there. So we have things like, again, uh, chicken fat, avocado oil, safflower oil have a lot of the cis monounsaturated fatty acids. If we look at the cis polyunsaturated fatty acids, we have omega-3 fatty acids as well as omega-6 fatty acids, if you look at that flow chart. But in this particular image or graph, you'll notice that it doesn't necessarily tease out which particular foods or oils are going to be omega-3 versus omega-6. But you can see that we have a situation where we've got, again, cottonseed oil has a lot of cis polyunsaturated fatty acid, corn oil does, canola oil. But what we want to do is lean towards some of those foods that have more of the essential fatty acids that are going to be um, types of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, specific lengths, specific locations of different double bonds. And we're, that's why we recommend cold water fatty fish, walnuts, almonds, sunflower seeds to help you meet those polyunsaturated fatty acid needs um, and meet your essential fatty acid needs. So with our trans fat, these are banned for use. Um, and the question might be like, or are they? Because here on this particular chart, you'll notice that shortening is in there. And shortening is actually um, made in part by hydrogenating a vegetable oil. So some of the, um, the monounsaturated fatty acids in that shortening might be um, trans fatty acids. If you want to read more about trans fatty acids and kind of learn how you can apply it in your own life, here we've got an article from Cleveland Clinic. So you can use the QR code and read more. And just a short summary is by January 2023, the U.S. food manufacturers will no longer be allowed to sell foods containing partially hydrogenated oil or man-made fats. And this was a major 
public health achievement. It was such a win. I was like, yay, that's awesome. But let me say, but uh, manufacturers can still sell foods if those foodstuffs have less than 0.5 grams of trans fat per serving, because we round on the nutrition facts panel. If we have something that has 0.4 grams or less, then we round down to zero. So with that in mind, they alter serving sizes, they alter the formulations. So you might be summatively adding up you know, 0.4 grams of trans fat here, 0.4 grams of trans fat there, and you might be consuming more trans fat than you necessarily realize. As we continue on to that next subcategory, the phospholipids, you might wonder where might we find those? What foods contain phospholipids? Well, we have them in our eggs. Like we mentioned, we have lecithin in our eggs because liver has a lot of cells in it from an animal. It's gonna have phospholipids as well. Lean meats, because again, they have that cellular bilayer, though they are going to have phospholipids. Fish, some cereal grains are actually gonna have some phospholipids in them if they had emulsifiers added in as a component of that particular formulation. And then things that are like oil seeds. You might wonder where we find dietary cholesterol. And you might say, Tony, you didn't change the picture. Well, I didn't change the picture because a lot of the same foods that have phospholipids do have cholesterol, but with a little caveat, cholesterol is only, 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 only found in foods that have an animal component. So animal food products, such as eggs that came from chickens, liver that came from an animal, lean meats, which is the flesh of an animal that's been harvested, fish, shellfish, butter, all of these come from an animal and therefore can contain cholesterol. Like I said, it's similar to phospholipids, but we do not find cholesterol in any plant foodstuffs. So when we look at our fats, I told you before that with our fats and lipids, we have essential fatty acids, meaning we need to consume those fatty acids or else we're going to have a deficiency. We're going to get sick. There are going to be problems. And we only really need the omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids and a select um, type of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. So we do not need any saturated fat. No saturated fat is needed in our diet. None. We also don't need any monounsaturated fatty acids even. So no monounsaturated fatty acids. Definitely we don't need any trans fats. So we just need these PUFAs, these polyunsaturated fatty acids that have a double bond uh, three on the third carbon from the omega end or on the sixth carbon from the omega end. And so if you think about a Mediterranean diet, we recommend that you consume that diet because it is high in these omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. They have sardines and tuna, herring, salmon. Um, these are all going to be seafood that is very high in these omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. But we can also find these essential fatty acids in flaxseed and walnuts. You can even take a supplement like a krill oil supplement that is going to help you meet your fatty acid needs if you don't enjoy any of these foods. And you say, okay, yeah, they might be essential fatty acids, but what are they needed for? Tell me, Tony, I want to hear more. So if you're trying to learn what they're needed for, well, infants definitely need the essential fatty acids for their development or else there's going to be major problems, specifically with brain health in infants as their brain is growing. And even with adults, we have epithelial tissue repair. I had mentioned before that in my sinus cavity, in my lungs, um, in my bladder and my urinary tract, we have epithelial tissue that's covering that. And so if we don't have the essential fatty acids, that epithelial tissue growth and health is going to be compromised. It also helps with certain types of cancer prevention, because if our cells are producing properly with the essential fatty acids, then it's going great. If we don't have what we need, we don't have the essential fatty acids, we can have cellular growth that goes awry, which is more or less what cancer is. We want these essential fatty acids to help with the anatomy and physiology of our eyes and vision functioning. If we have the proper amount of the essential fatty acids, it decreases the incidence of heart disease, decreases incidence of type two diabetes, decreases neurological disorders, no joke, kind of exciting, as well as neuropsychiatric uh, disorders. So make sure that you're getting these essential fatty acids in your food, or that you're at least taking a krill oil or fish oil supplement to make sure that you are taken care of. 
And I love the information from the FDA and the USDA. They discuss cholesterol in more detail. And so let's just highlight what they say. So here we have, um, this is a screenshot from the FDA and they say cholesterol is a waxy fat-like substance found in all the cells of our body. And so we do need this. And cholesterol is a precursor to things like bile and other types of needed components in our body itself. So we don't need to eat it. Our body can actually produce it. My liver can make cholesterol. So I can be a vegan, have a completely vegan diet, and my body will still make the cholesterol it needs. So it's not, dietary cholesterol is not essential either. We do not need to have it. But we it, it's found in those animal products like we had mentioned. Um, if our body liver makes cholesterol. Um, it can be a structural component of cell membranes. Yay. That's good. Our body's going to make what it needs. Um, it's necessary for the production of bile, like we had mentioned, and it's also necessary to make vitamin D from sun exposure with the use of our skin, our liver, and our kidneys. So cholesterol is needed in our body. It is not needed in our diet. So cholesterol is not dietarily essential, but our liver is a giver and our liver makes it for us if we need it. So let's look at a health fact from the FDA. They say that many foods that are higher in dietary cholesterol are generally higher in saturated fat and diets higher in saturated fat are associated with an increased list, risk of developing cardiovascular disease. And so it's kind of recommended that we keep the cholesterol intake as low as possible. We don't need it in our diet. And this is also going to artificially decrease or again, synergistically decrease um, the um, amount of saturated fatty acid in our food. Again, independent cholesterol is independent from saturated fatty acid, but foods that are higher in cholesterol are often higher in saturated fatty acids. Therefore, if we lower our cholesterol, we're probably consuming foods that are lower in saturated fatty acids. And we want those as low as possible. As we move on, we want to talk about, again, the low density lipoprotein or that bad cholesterol. That cholesterol actually goes, drops off lipids in our arteries and clogs them up. It increases the risk of stroke, heart attack, and other things. In contrast, HDL or high density lipoprotein, you can think of that as like H for like the hero cholesterol. Yay, it's going to come and save the day. That cholesterol actually picks up um, lipids from our blood vessels, brings it to the liver for processing. So it cleans things up. It's like a little vacuum for our vessels. And lastly, when we talk about the daily value for cholesterol, it is less than 300 milligrams per day, meaning we don't want you to consume more than that. Again, we don't need to consume cholesterol in our diet at all. So when we're trying to make good choices, we want to compare and choose foods to get less than 100% of the daily value for cholesterol each day. So let's try things like seafood or plant protein sources. Those legumes are amazing. Again, you can go to a completely vegan diet and meet your body's needs. No cholesterol is needed in your diet at all. And if you are going to choose meats, choose ones that are more lean. So lean cuts of meat, lean cuts of poultry and trim the fat off, take the skin off before you're eating it and make sure that you are trying to minimize that saturated fatty acid consumption as well as cholesterol consumption. If you're cooking, you can substitute fat-free or low fat dairy products. So you can cook with fat-free milk, substitute it away. You do not need that full fat milk in a lot of traditional recipes. And more often cook and bake with liquid vegetable oils that are going to allow you to have more monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids and less of the butter, lard, shortening, and coconut oil. And if you want to, you can opt for foods that do not contain any cholesterol or any saturated fat. So things like beans, peas, lentils, fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, highly recommended. So I want to ask you, how would you apply this to your life? What recommendations would you have for others who are asking questions on the topic? So I'll leave you with that. And I hope that you've learned a lot by joining this discussion with me. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. My door is always open.